Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we are concluding a six-week series on the topic, Know the Law. As we conclude this series, I would like to publicly recognize the Kootenai County Bar Association and the members of the court, uh, judges who have been on our program, and representatives from the Spokane Bar Association. Our last program is going to be uh, concerning the subtopic, the rights of criminal defendants. In order to pursue this very important topic, I am very happy to welcome to our program three guests. First of all is Mr. Glenn Walker, the Kootenai County Prosecuting Attorney, uh, Magistrate Craig Kutsonen of the Idaho Judicial System, and Mr. Charles Limpus, who is the Public Defender for Kootenai County. Gentlemen, welcome, and we're happy to have you with us. Nice Thank to you. Thank you. I also am happy to welcome back to assist me in questioning our guest, a permanent uh, panel member of our public forum, uh, Lou Reed, and I will invite her to commence the question. Thank you, Tony. Gentlemen, let's start out from the point of arrest. We have a suspected criminal who was picked up by the police, and let's call him Joe, and uh, they accuse him of shoplifting. Now, at that point, what are his rights? Can I direct this question to you, Glenn? Well, perhaps I should start out by saying basically what's going to happen to him. Uh, shoplifting is a misdemeanor. We call it willful concealment in Idaho. Uh, he would be uh, arrested, uh, taken to jail. Uh, he, before that, he would have been ad advised of his right to remain silent, his re uh, right to an attorney. Uh, things of this nature. Uh, perhaps he will talk, perhaps he won't. Uh, but uh, he would be bonded out on the misdemeanor and uh, he would then contact an attorney after that. What if he had broken into to the store and uh, had stolen it and was accused of stealing something? If he had broken into the store, uh, it would then be burglary and that's a felony punishable by imprisonment in the Idaho State Penitentiary for up to 15 years. Obviously much more serious. Uh, the case would be handled more seriously by the police. Uh, the same thing would happen. He would be advised of his rights. Uh, he may or may not talk, but uh, the odds are that he would be contacting an attorney because bond would not be so easily attainable. So he'd probably contact his attorney uh, soon after he got to the jail. Maybe we should bring in then Chuck, our public defender here, to, to say, at this point, would you be the person who would perhaps be contacted? Um, in all likelihood, at that point, not, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I don't want this to sound like a simple process where we're taken to jail and we immediately bond out. That's not necessarily the case. Hopefully it is. Uh, the Public Defender's Office would only be appointed at the time of the uh, first appearance, which must occur within 24 hours of the time that the person's arrested. Uh, conceivably, if you were arrested on a Friday evening, you would not have a first appearance before a magistrate until Monday. So at that time, uh, if you were indigent and could not afford counsel, that would be your first opportunity to have our office appointed. And then it's likely that it'd be several hours, perhaps a day, before a public defender could physically come down and counsel you and be present. Thank you. Uh, Judge Casona, and I'll let you pick up at this point and tell our viewers um, that have been fortunate and haven't gone through this process, uh, but might have to face that in the future. As this process has taken place that Mr. Walker and Mr. Limpus have been talking about, and the person has been arrested and they are in jail, uh, prior to getting out or being bonded and so forth, there's some processes that take place. And then even after they get out, uh, I understand there are some. Would you distinguish the difference between the arraignment for the defendant and the preliminary hearing? Arraignment is a proceeding at which the defendant enters a plea, usually, uh, is the common denominator distinguishing an arraignment from any other proceeding. The first time the defendant appears in court on a misdemeanor, he may at that time plead. Not so with a felony. The first appearance in court is called, for want of any other term, a first appearance. At that time he's told of the charge, the penalties, his rights. Inquiry is made as to whether or not he has a lawyer, and if not, if he requests court-appointed counsel, the determination is made by the court then if he's indigent and can't afford an attorney. Excuse me, this first appearance too, he may still be in jail or he may be out before this appearance? Maybe, maybe either. 
a person arrested on a misdemeanor can post bail a lot easier than one arrested on a felony because there's a set bond schedule. There is no bond schedule for felonies and it requires an order by the court setting bail. Now he uh, may have bonded out, may not, before he comes to court, but he's entitled to be brought with uh, the most practicable expediency before a court and advised of his rights uh, and what the procedures are so that he knows what's happening and what his next step should be. Let me ask another question here. If he is brought before the court in the first case, the first instance, and it's a very serious felony, uh, and let's suppose that he has not been informed of his Miranda rights, and the court at this time uh, takes care of that problem, does he really have uh, grounds for dismissal or a possible appeal? Is it too late to give the um, information at that time, is particularly if he has made comments to the police? Well, this is an area probably as misunderstood as any other area in the criminal law. And people, I don't know about Glenn and Chuck, if you get inquiries that way or not, but we get a number of inquiries by people saying, they didn't read me my rights. What does that mean? The, this flows from decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court that simply said that if you have not been advised of your right to counsel, right to court-appointed counsel, the right to remain silent, and the like, and you thereafter make a damaging admission or confess, the confession or admission probably won't be introducible in evidence against you at the trial. Now this does not necessarily mean the case will be dismissed, it just means that the state would not be able to introduce that particular item of evidence if in fact they had that item of evidence, but it doesn't necessarily result in a dismissal of the case. Idaho's legislature has adopted a statutory provision requiring that they be notified of rights and they be done in writing and so on. I have one more question in this area. I know sometimes that one notices in the media that after one's had that first instance in court and there's a process going on and maybe if the person cannot afford their own attorney and Chuck is involved as a public defender and, and Glenn is involved in preparing the prosecution, that there's oftentimes another hearing, I believe the preliminary hearing prior to the trial in which even some testimony will be presented to the court. Uh, could you give us a little more clarification on what's going on at that time? That occurs in preliminary hearings, Tony, uh, in felonies. The law requires that anybody charged with a felony be entitled to a preliminary hearing within 14 days of the demand for the preliminary hearing if they're in custody and within 21 days of the demand if they're free on bond or recognizance. The preliminary hearing is a trial-like proceeding in which evidence is presented in court before a judge sitting without a jury, but the defendant present, he's entitled to be present, represented by counsel, he's entitled to see and hear all the witnesses testifying against him and examine all the evidence. The defendant may or may not choose to put on evidence himself at the preliminary hearing. The reason for the preliminary hearing is that if you're charged with a felony and you wait till trial on the merits, it can be some time before you're acquitted if that's the way it ought to be. The law determined that one shouldn't wait that long to find out if they've got the wrong man or if there's a defense available at, at law. And hence this quick hearing at which the state is required to produce sufficient evidence to persuade the judge presiding there that there's probable cause to believe that this defendant committed the offense. If that determination is made, the case simply really just stays alive and moves on to the next phase. If the determination is not made, the case can be dismissed. Well, it would be dismissed, and it, it could be refiled, however. But guilt or innocence is not determined. <coughs> Lou Reed. Let, let me see if, if we're getting the list of the, the catalog of these lists. He, he has, at the time of arrest, uh, he should be advised of his Miranda rights, and that includes the right to counsel and the right to remain silent. Then he, is, uh, he has a right to a preliminary hearing. Does that preliminary hearing satisfy the constitutional requirement for a speedy trial, or is that a subsequent right which he should enjoy? Let me ask you, Glenn, because we've had so much here from the The, the preliminary hearing is a, is a creature of the Idaho statutes. It's not a federal... Constitutional. Uh, right. It's not a federal constitutional obligation that we have. Uh, simply, as Judge Casona indicated, 
a method of, uh, since trial may be a good time down the road, to make certain that uh, there is some reasonable basis for holding this person and charging him with a crime. It's what we call a probable cause standing, probable cause uh, standard, that is, the prosecution must put on sufficient evidence to show that a person, this person, is the person who uh, likely committed uh, this criminal offense, and that, of course, the criminal offense did occur. Uh, that's all the prosecution has to uh, put forward. The prosecution is putting forward the evidence. The defense attorney, in most cases, does not put on evidence, although he may. The defendant uh, rarely ever takes a stand in such a case. It's simply to show that there's more reason to believe that a crime was committed than that it wasn't committed, and that this defendant did it than that he didn't do it. That's all it is. At that point, then, uh, the person is bound over or held to answer in district court at that point, the time for the speedy trial starts to run. And in Idaho, the speedy trial rule is six months from, uh, from after the preliminary hearing. We file what is called an information. Most people would be more uh, uh, used to knowing the term indictment, perhaps, but it's a criminal charge. We call it an information. And at that point, he stands trial on that technical pleading called an information. Six months from that, uh, from that time, he has to have his trial unless he waives that time period, which is also not uncommon. Well, the obvious question here is actually, d does the, do the courts move with this due speed? And I, I think I should ask you, Chuck, if, if this requirement, the six months, is actually held to, and uh, if, if, you're, uh, if your clients actually are getting uh, speedy trials within the context of, of the North Idaho system. Within the context of the North Idaho system, I, I think the statutes ensure that they're receiving speedy trials by virtue of the fact that their trial must be within six months of the filing of the information. There are, of course, exceptions to that uh, where good cause can be shown. Uh, it's been suggested by, by some members of the judiciary that good cause could include overcrowding of the court's calendar, and the Supreme Court hasn't really uh, made a decision on that issue. Um, six months is a long time to sit in any jail, especially for an innocent person doesn't seem very speedy. Right? No, it certainly does not. And that uh, six months period only starts from the time the information is filed. Prior to that, you have uh, the investigative stage, possibly. You would have the arrest. You'd have the uh, preliminary hearing within uh, 14 or 21 days, depending on whether or not the defendant is in custody. So the average process would, would run somewhere between five and, five and eight months in all likelihood. And I think uh, Washington may have an advantage, and of course they have more judges and a bigger system, but I think a 90-day requirement at, at minimum would expedite matters and be to the benefit of both the state and the criminal defendant. I'd like to comment on, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like right. to comment on that if I could. The Washington requirement is that uh, if a person is in custody, uh, 60 days from the time of his arrest, if he's in custody, he must be brought to trial. 90 days uh, from the time uh, if he is not in custody. That's far more speedy than ours. Uh, our six months uh, uh, time, in most cases, will work to the advantage of defendants. You won't find very many prosecutors uh, objecting to a shorter time for trial. I would much rather see far speedier time. The most ca in most cases, when it does not happen within six months, it is because the defense attorneys request it, because the prosecution has to put on the case. It's the prosecution who has to have the witnesses uh, and all the evidence. Witnesses dim, uh, uh, memories fade and it works to the disadvantage of prosecution the longer it's held out. We don't want defendants sitting around for a long time in jail prior to trial, but it works to their advantage when, in most cases, when it uh, goes beyond that period. There are rare exceptions when the case is so complicated that it just takes a very long time to put the case together. That's very rare. Prosecutors are, would be very much in favor of a shorter time for trial. It's certainly also uh, costly to keep people in prison. It certainly is. And Judge Consultant, do you find that if you, if you know that it's going to be an incredibly crowded calendar that you are more inclined to grant bail if you think that the trial is going to uh, be actually as far away as six months? Does this influence it's, you at all, can it's it? It's never been a factor. Mm -hmm. I've never considered that. The standards on uh, admittance to bail usually, well, they can embrace that and it would be a factor in a, an appropriate case, but the actual times uh, available in Kootenai County, and I don't have them right before me, but I've, I've read them each of the past succeeding years, preceding years, it's uh, around 30 days for a misdemeanor and, and somewhere around 90 days for a felony in Kootenai County. So it is we, moving. 
Go ahead. We need to move into some real technical areas. Now we have this person arrested, and they may be out on bail, and they may not. And we've got to worry about uh, Chuck's <coughs> role as public defender and Glenn's as prosecuting attorney. You both got to prepare your case. You've got to go into court, and you've got to try uh, the case. And there's a lot of procedures that are very important to both the state and the defendant at this point. And I'd like to go over some of those. And my question at this point is directed to both Mr. Walker and Mr. Olympus. Um, Chuck, you are representing the defendant. What are some of the processes that you and the defendant must do, A, to prepare to go into court, and then when you're in court, what you're doing? And I'm, I'm just going to give you a chance to elaborate on this. And I would give the examples uh, as you're preparing the case, and Mr. Walker has the evidence against the defendant. What do you have a right to examine or not prior to the trial, both in cross-examining or talking to his witnesses or his evidence? Uh, also, what rights does the defendant have to ask for a jury trial, those kind of things. When you finish, then I would like Mr. Walker to give the prosecution side of what he has the right to know about the defense's evidence and information and his role in the selection of the jury and so forth. It's a rather elaborate question. I think it's very important to the viewers, and we'll start with you, Chuck. Okay. <clears throat> that is an elaborate question. Um, the first thing that is important in, in developing a relationship between a defense counsel and a, and a person who's been charged with a, with a criminal offense obviously is developing a rapport and a trusting relationship. Um, there has nationwide, and, and this is not an overstatement or an understatement, been a feeling that if you are appointed the public defender you have received less than a lawyer. Um, I think perhaps the public defenders have been responsible for that to some extent. I don't think that's the case in Kootenai County, and I, I don't think that's a feeling here. Um, I think you have to ensure the client, first of all, that you are on his team and are going to work with him. Um, the second thing that you want to do is convince your client to be absolutely truthful with you. If you can develop that sort of relationship, you're a hundred percent further ahead than you would be if he decides to deceive his attorney. Only a fool should lie to his lawyer. Um, the third thing that we always hope for is that the defendant has not made any pretrial statements. Regardless of whether or not you're informed of your rights, the, the best advice any attorney can give anybody who thinks they may be charged criminally is to keep their mouth shut, period whether or not they are advised of their rights. You can make voluntary statements whether or not you're advised of your rights, which would be admissible. <coughs> At that point, we conduct some background information. Um, we conduct a preliminary investigation, and we make some basic determinations of whether or not it's likely the case will proceed to trial, um, whether or not there is a room for plea bargaining in the event that we have a, a person who admits his guilt and desires to deal with it in that fashion, or if it's going to proceed to trial, we will in most cases uh, either investigate it thoroughly ourselves, obtain witnesses, or hire a private investigator. And through motions for discovery and so forth, you do have a right to know something about the evidence that Mr. Walker will present. Absolutely. Under Rule 16 of the Idaho Criminal Rules, uh, we are obliged to request from the Office of the Prosecuting Attorney all of the facts and information which he has available through either uh, a state or, or local police department or other facts he has obtained. And the prosecutor's office in this county uh, will routinely answer that, just as he can compel us to uh, supply uh, him with the uh, reports of, in, of uh, uh, experts uh, or physical evidence which may exist or witnesses which are prepared to testify at trial. Um, the only other thing which is, is critical in that process are normally your pretrial motions. And those would be motions in court to suppress and exclude certain illegally obtained evidence, whether that is physical evidence, items such as a, as a weapon, which are obtained without a search warrant or contrary to uh, the law, or whether it's statements that are made uh, uh, without uh, voluntariness on the part of the defendant uh, or having been, in, in rare instances, coerced from the defendant, and we would seek to suppress those that a jury would not consider them in. Uh, in uh, trying the case. And so those would be excluded <coughs> from the trial under the exclusionary rule? Well, we would try to have them excluded. Whether or not they're excluded would be up, up to, to the, the court. Judge. Of course, there's always cases of appeal, too, and, and those cases right. possibly. Uh, also, how about the right to jury trial? Uh, people need to know when they do and do not have a right to jury trial. Okay, you have a right to a jury trial in the state of Idaho, uh, to my recollection, in any offense, whether misdemeanor or criminal. Um, at this point in time. In a felony, you are obligated to have a jury trial in the state of Idaho, and that would be a jury of 12 persons. Uh, in the past, many defense counsel have sought to have a judge hear the case on their own. Sometimes that's desirous, especially where you're dealing with legal, not factual issues, and under the present, present statutes, you are required to have a jury make the decision of guilt or innocence. 
in a felony proceeding. Now, Mr. Walker, we need to turn to your side of the story and uh, tell us how you prepare and uh, what your role is in the court. I'll certainly do that, Tony. I, I first, first of all, I have to correct uh, my friend Chuck's uh, last statement. <coughs> Chuck Lempsis, by the way, is a very fine public defender. I think the best that there's ever been in this county. He certainly does an excellent job of representing his clients. Uh, so I, I, I say that as a, a lead in to, have to having to correct him. Uh, we do now in Idaho have the right to have a uh, felony jury trial, a felony trial uh, without the presence of a jury. It takes uh, effect July 1st, I believe, doesn't it? It was July 1st of, uh, of l last July. That is if the defendant agrees yeah, to Both it. the state and, and the, the defendant have to waive that. That's right. And uh, we have not had uh, in Idaho, as of yet, to my knowledge, we have not had a felony trial uh, without a jury. But we do have that right now if both sides uh, chooses to go that way. So it's something that's new and we haven't tried it yet. But the defendant himself cannot waive that jury. That's right. It, it has, has to, to be, be with both sides. The prosecutor. You bet. It has to be both sides. And in fact, recently in my office, we had, <clears throat> we had one decision that one of my deputies was uh, trying to convince me that. Uh, well, maybe we should take this one just before a judge, uh, and I, I made a decision that I, I, I don't want to be the first one to do that, uh, because I do believe in the jury trial, and I really uh, would like to see that continued. I, I don't imagine we'll have very many of those type situations. In, uh, in misdemeanor cases, it's pretty common to have uh, non-jury non trials. I think, Tony, the, uh, the place that I should start would be when a, a case generally first comes to my office. Uh, and again, we'll approach the felony situation. I think those are the ones that have the most significance. Even though most people are, are charged with crimes or charged with misdemeanors, the ones that are most noteworthy of felonies. We get the file in the office, and it's a police report that's submitted to us uh, by the agency, by the police agency. The policeman or a deputy sheriff may be there, or he may just send in the report. We then go over it and we refer to this as the charging decision. We uh, make a decision whether to charge a crime. If so, what should that crime be? We take a lot of things into consideration. I frankly believe that this is the most important part of the prosecutor's role. Because with that decision, you can literally destroy a person's life. The public in so many instances has a tendency to believe that a person charged with a crime is guilty of a crime. And even though we all know that we are presumed innocent uh, until proven guilty, nonetheless, uh, that isn't al also always the public uh, feeling. So I think that charging decision is so important. What we charge a person with, whether it be rape or aggravated battery, whether it be murder or manslaughter, and there's many things we could charge under a certain circumstance. So we make that charging decision, and uh, with that, we, we, we look at uh, who the witnesses are, uh, what the circumstances are, and. Mary Lou, uh, and your question earlier, Tony, about uh, uh, reading a person as rights, uh, we look whether this has happened. Uh, there aren't that many cases that come to us where a person has already confessed. Uh, if he has, then we look to whether or not he's been read his rights. But if there's no indication of that or that he's said anything at all, and in many cases the defendant is nowhere to be found when we file the charge, so there's never any question of whether he's been read his rights or not. The, evidence, the case is made in the vast majority of cases, whether a person has been read his rights or not. Maybe he's never even been, been contacted by the police agency. So you're dealing with other types of evidence, eyewitnesses, fingerprints, uh, evidence uh, missing a person having been there right before that, any number of things that it could, uh, could come in. We review those things. We decide uh, that a case is worthy of filing and we charge a felony crime. The, we have the police officer go before the court in what is called a probable cause hearing the officer then swears out a complaint before the magistrate judge, like Judge Kasonan here. Uh, if Judge Kasonan uh, sees that there is sufficient evidence for the filing of a charge, he will then sign the complaint and perhaps a warrant or a summons would be issued for the defendant. Uh, we then, as soon as the defendant is arrested or brought before the court, we get into the issue, issue of bail. Uh, uh, we, uh, we look at his record, uh, his uh, length of time in the community, his ties to the community, many things like that. Uh, I assign the case within the office to a deputy prosecutor. Uh, we uh, then, uh, per sometimes we would get in contact with the attorney if there is an attorney already on board. Uh, the public defender, of course, as he indicated, is not on board until he is appointed by the court. Once that time, then we're getting ready for, uh, you ask about getting ready for trial, we're getting ready at that point for a preliminary hearing, if there is to be one. And in many cases, a defendant will waive a preliminary hearing, uh, or there may be uh, two charges. Maybe one is burglary and one, maybe one is grand theft. 
maybe the defendant would say, hey, if you will uh, dismiss one of them, I would plead guilty to the other. So that we then have a decision to make whether if you enter into that kind of a plea negotiation, if that's in the public interest, if justice can be done with a plea to one as opposed to two. So we go through all of those things. The prosecutor's time is spent about 95 percent of the time and also about 95, 90 to 95 percent of the cases never go to jury trial. So the prosecutor's time is spent in the office dealing with paper, making decisions, uh, uh, looking up witnesses, talking to witnesses, uh, talking to judges, talking to defense attorneys. Very little of our time is ever spent in, in trial. So our cases, if we're going to be successful, are, are depending, dependent upon how well we do in preparing the case. Lou Reed. But if we do go to trial, and we only have a couple minutes uh, left to get our, our defendant through, through this trial, uh, he has some rights uh, during the trial itself. He, of course, has a, has a right to, to the jury, which was mentioned earlier. But he also, um, I think, has some rights in, in relationship to the, the kinds of evidence, and he certainly has uh, Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, Judge Casona, would you talk about if the rules of evidence? Are they different in uh, a criminal trial, and are there some protections for the defendant in relationship to evidence? The rules of evidence, Lou, are substantially the rules of evidence, whether it's a civil trial or a mm -hmm. criminal trial. There's some particular evidentiary rules that are peculiar to the criminal law because they've grown out of the criminal law, but as far as hearsay is concerned, best evidence, uh, parole evidence, the traditional things that I'm sure uh, mean absolutely nothing to the average viewer, uh, they're the same. The, the fundamental basic evidentiary rules are the same. But particular things like the exclusionary rule, Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, uh, Eighth Amendment and bail, uh, those are, of course, unique to the, the criminal law. But the rights of a defendant in a, a trial are are many. Essentially, it, it, it comes down to this, that everyone agrees on the one hand that society ought to be entitled to enforce its rules. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's argued that society and its government is only here for the benefit of the individual. And it's required that the justice system keep the trial fair, that the evidence be brought out, but the, the rights of the individual not be steamrolled in the process of this rush to judgment. It's entitled to be present. Fundamental is the presumption of innocence. It, it has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, and the state has the burden of proving that. It has to be a fair, speedy public trial, a number of things. It would take some time to go through it. I'm sorry we're out of time. Uh, I want to say on behalf of our staff, you've been just excellent in informing our viewers about this process, and Lou's questions have been outstanding. And I know our viewers have enjoyed this series uh, all six weeks, and this was a nice way to end it. And I hope you'll be with us again next week on a different subject. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.